Whew. That Sunday morning 5.30 alarm came rather quickly after a rather late Saturday night birthday party. But, you know, the alarm sounds that much sweeter when you get up and you enjoy and savor an away victory and a clean sheet. Lots of moments, many talking points. Let's get right into it. Chelsea nil, Aston Villa won. And so this Unai Emery bounce-back phenomenon continues, and so does this quirky stat where he has never presided over a nil-nil draw in the Premier League. And how about this suit, by the way? I mean, the man looks good in a suit, but how about this suit with the lion badge there? I'm not going to be ashamed to admit to you that I have a man crush on our manager. I imagine he smells like sandalwood with some fine Spanish leather, maybe a hint of bourbon and a whiff of citrus. And I'm also not ashamed to say that I'd like to take him on a mandate. And we would sit down and we'd have a fine bottle of Rioja, some truffle-infused Manchego cheese, good Spanish olives, and a big old bowl of mussels with a hunk of bread to dunk in the sauce after. And look who our special correspondents were for this game. Why, the Handsakers themselves, 24-7 services leadership team. Paul and his sons Owen and Mitchell, who are design and decorating gurus for the company. These lads know their interior and exterior design. Off they went to Stamford Bridge, and now they will be required to attend every away game from here on in. By the way, the Villa support popped out of my speakers, and what a fun day it must have been in West London. That drive home must have been so satisfying. And if you are keen on doing some beautification to your home, your rental, even your office or commercial property in the near future, the 24-7 quote will be fair, and you can talk the villa with any of the lads at no extra charge. Except for Baggies fans, and I know you're watching. May I officially welcome you to the Holy Trinity show from the parlor here in Canada. Trinity, not just for the Trinity Road stand, but also Trinity means three. And these are the three key issues or moments that defined Chelsea nil, Aston Villa one. And we'll start with the key numbers. I decided to focus on the number of times each team was caught offside. Numbers went Chelsea's way for the most part, XG for sure. Villa's shots on target versus attempts ratio, better in this game, very even on the accurate passing. Only one big chance for Villa, by the way, and possession not far off. But look at how many times we caught Chelsea offside. This takes so much discipline. You got to keep your line square and you got to step forward all together at once or you get burned. And we'll talk a little bit more about the high line later on this show because I know it makes a lot of people uncomfortable but here you can see why it works. First a word on Chelsea Football Club. I've got a buddy named Aza who is a huge Blues fan along with many other friends and just like all of Chelsea Nation they're truly frustrated. Three games without scoring, 10 players out through injury doesn't help but this is a club that has spent half a billion dollars on footballers over the last couple of seasons. And my theory has been all along, just watching how things have been done, is that Todd Bowley, the guy who, well, holds or opens the purse strings for Blue Co., the consortium that owns the club, I believe he thought that he could literally take the L.A. Dodgers Major League Baseball money ball kind of paradigm and somehow employ it into English football. The problem is that baseball is actually an incredibly individual sport. And individual statistics are absolute and relevant. You have a batting percentage, you have an on-base percentage, and you have a fielding percentage. And if those numbers are good, and you're some hotshot from Puerto Rico or the Dominican or Cuba or Japan or North America, wherever, and you are consistently good at your numbers, then when you put that player into your team, theoretically, they should be able to help your team. That's the whole premise behind Moneyball. The problem is 
football is not an individual sport and stats are arbitrary or sometimes taken out of context. And another thing that he decided to steal from baseball was to amortize these contracts over eight years. So he goes out and he collects every heavily tattooed, perfectly quaffed hipster golden boy footballer, signs them to long eight-year contracts without any kind of plan and says to the latest manager up, you figure this out. But what happens in financial fair play if they don't get to the Champions League and he has to sell on some of these contracts. Who's taking a five, six, or seven-year contract? The Saudi Pro League is not going to bail Chelsea out forever. And then he keeps talking about doubling revenue. Well, how is he going to double revenue? With a no-sponsor shirt deal? Or by gouging supporters? Somebody in that club needs to save Todd Bowley from himself. Recurring issue is how Aston Villa's high line continuously makes my sphincter pucker up real small and it does compress the midfield and forces the opponent to sometimes rush a ball or overhit a ball or have to think quickly because you've compressed the midfield now and you do have a lot of space to play in behind but you still have to play the perfect ball. With Chelsea, there is no shortage of players who can exploit that space and run in behind. Nicholas Jackson, Chilwell, Mudrick, Sterling, and it happened to us again and again, and we got away with it. Now, Ezri Konza, he has recovery pace to burn. I think Cash does as well. Pau Torres and Luca Dean always look like they are one tiny toe tackle nick away from giving away a penalty. So I will never question Unai's principles or approach because you know what? It's working. But ever since he's arrived, I look in the mirror and I see way more gray hair and wrinkles. Big issue. Emmy Martinez was clutch today. And I talked about the high line and how it led to a lot of breakaway type chances, including one that should have been called offside. In fact, there were a couple in that category. You're telling me that's not going to lead to an injury to a goalkeeper one day, Raheem Sterling, straight down Main Street, and he still couldn't put it past Martinez, but there were others. And I realize it doesn't hurt that Chelsea looks like a team that couldn't score in a Turkish brothel. Not that I'm disparaging Turkish brothels over others. I'm just saying it's a team that is jittery in front of goal right now. The Ben Chilwell one, later on after Villa had taken the lead. I mean, he's about eight to 10 yards away from goal. The shot is going on target and Martinez goes down to his right to make it look easy. And I sometimes wonder if these players are bearing down on this giant neon green monster coming out of his goal. And I wonder if the thought just flashes through their mind, I'm going up against the World Cup winning goalkeeper. I have to be extra fine and whether that somehow changes what they do. Big issue. We need Alex Moreno and Diego Carlos back, neither on the bench even on Sunday at Chelsea. And now we find out that Alex Moreno is probably not close, whether it's a setback or he's still not feeling right. They're going to be very precautious because it's a hamstring. And if you get that wrong, it's months out. So it sounds not like days. It sounds like it could still be weeks based on what Unai Emery said. And there's no update on Diego Carlos. And that's been a bit of a mystery. And the problem is Luca Dean and Ezri Konza have gone 90 minutes back to back here. And we have a Carabao Cup game on Wednesday. After the Chelsea game, Ezri Konza was asked how he's doing. He said, I'm tired. That's concerning. And a lot of people wondered, why are we so obsessed with trying to get another fullback during the summer transfer window? Now we see why. This is concerning. There's no Seb Revan. He's on loan with Rotherham now, so he's not an option. Are we going to have to do a makeshift type job? Is somebody going to have to play out of position? We need to get Alex Moreno and Diego Carlos back as soon as possible. Irritating issue. 11 minutes of stoppage time. Was that Jared Gallette? 
adding on the time that he mysteriously forgot to add on at the end of the first half. Oh, quick shout out to Alan Crampton who has this fantastic charitable initiative where you give him $7 and he'll paint your likeness in a little plastic figurine that will be situated in his spectacular Villa Park Subudio Stadium, which puts this one behind me to utter and embarrassing shame. And the proceeds go to do it for Defib, who put defibrillators around the community. And Alan figures lives have already been saved because of this initiative. Now, here we are from the tour last spring. That's me on the right. That's Richard Davies, a perfect likeness on the left, cheering away from Midland Honda, tour sponsor, and in the middle is my wife, Sandra. And look at, Alan's got the detail so accurate. She's sitting uncomfortably cross-legged because she's had too much Bovril, desperate for a pee, but doesn't want to use the public toilets. Now, if you want to be in Alan's stadium, you can find Alan all over social media, but if you can't, just let me know and I'll hook you up. Big issue number three, spectacular Sanchez. Chelsea's goalkeeper was the man of the match by quite some distance. Had he not been sharp, this could have been a very different story. I was surprised, actually, when Chelsea went in for him, but then when you think about the fact that Brighton is basically their very expensive reserve academy, it made kind of sense for him to rejoin all of his ex-teammates that are at Stamford Bridge now, but he made a couple of really sharp and instinctive saves, starting with the Luca Dean absolute beautiful wallop that he tipped over spectacularly and then not long after Nicolo Zaniolo spun and volleyed one again look at how close to the goal he is he had no time to react so this is almost instinct to me by the way our Italian stallion doesn't look like he's going to be in a villa goal drought for long he does need to work on some other things though defensively duels tackles his dribbles being dispossessed all that stuff that needs to sharpen up but there is an x factor to this guy but the best save of the lot for me was the one off jacob ramsey where ramsey cleverly used the chelsea defender as a screen tried to bend it in the far corner and sanchez gets across in no time and with two hands pushes it around the post it's ironic that the one that beat him seemed to catch him by surprise, but I think it caught the whole stadium by surprise. Big issue number two, Ollie off the mark. Did you know that Ollie Watkins did not touch the football for the first quarter of that match? It was 22 minutes and 28 seconds when he finally touched the ball and despite that he was still drenched with sweat i've seen wet t-shirt contests with less saturation and cling than these new villa pro jerseys regardless this is the lonely life of a number nine you may not have any action you may have to initiate the press you may have to drag defenders away for other people you may have to combine with your teammates but when the chance arises you are expected to hit the target, and lo and behold, that is exactly what happened. And Unai Emery made special mention after the game that Ollie Watkins works like no other to improve, to be more clinical, to be more ruthless. And what a moment this was. Now, the goal would not have been possible if not for a rare error by Chelsea's senior citizen, Thiago Silva, as he just could not corral John McGinn's clearance. Was it a clearance or was he actually trying to pick out Musa Diaby and he left it short? But once Diaby got separation, the Brazilian was like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble here. I'm actually surprised he didn't take the foul, but Diaby might have skipped away anyway. And this is where we see the very best of the English Premier League and why the league is so good and why you have to be superb to play in this league because Diaby is now at full flight. So is Ollie Watkins. Diaby's being chased from behind and he's got a defender to worry about ahead of him. And in full flight, he plays the perfectly weighted ball into the path of Ollie Watkins. It looks simple. It looks like it's the only option, but you still have to be able to do it. And man, I've said enough times on this show already, we have ourselves a gem in Diaby. Did you know sometimes... You just need a little bit of luck because Levi Colwell does everything right here. He blocks the first shot. In fact, his touch on that block 
was too good. The ball almost spun back and sat there for Watkins to hit it a second time. How many times in that exact same situation would you see the ball go flying off the defender's foot for a corner or right back where it came from? Not this time. And this goal had some Arsenal last year at home vibes. That one slithered past and through Ramsdale. And this time it was the same thing against Sanchez. And he smacks it. And think about it. It's a right-footed shot, four yards from the byline. So he's hitting it right-footed, not left and bending it in that way. And it goes post and in. Now, I'm not sure if you noticed, but during his celebration, Ollie Watkins cradled his Aston Villa badge on his unusually soaked jersey, which made me wonder... Are we about to get confirmation of a contract extension here? Because those talks have apparently been ongoing for quite some time. And wouldn't it be lovely to be able to make that announcement after Ollie Watkins opens his account for the Premier League by scoring a game-winning goal again at Chelsea? What a massive three points that is. This player does divide our fan base. I realize that. But I believe, first of all, he's extremely popular amongst his teammates. I think he's highly respected by the technical people. And this was an example of why he is so important to us. Away points are like bonus points, especially when you're on a home winning run like Aston Villa is on. Maybe it allows you to be a little bit more saucy in your team's selection for games like Everton on Wednesday or in the future of the Europa Conference League. And the number one big issuer moment that defined Chelsea nil, Aston Villa won, Gusto gone. And you're probably thinking, well, how could Ollie Watkins' impossible angle post an in game winner not be the biggest moment of this match? Well, there was a major change in the whole vibe around 57, 58 minutes. And you could see it in the body language of both teams, and you could feel it in the crowd. The moment when Jared Gillette, who had a rather uneven game, in my opinion, was summoned to the monitor at field level for an on-pitch review. Now, Luca Dean had an eventful game as well. He somehow got a bloodied nose from Raheem Sterling. That was reviewed, but without any consequences. So, ironically... It was Dean again involved on the receiving end of Gusto's tackle. And thankfully, it wasn't worse because the last thing we need is another injury to a defender. The minute the Australian referee walked away from the screen and headed to the field, I knew we were going to be up a man. But I remember these situations quite clearly in the past, and Aston Villa... Didn't always take advantage of these situations. I recall the trip to Elland Road last year, for example. But you could see the confidence change in the game. Villa had more of the ball. They were doing exactly what I was hoping they were going to do. Play it from side to side. Play it from front to back. Force Chelsea to chase on their own patch to try to stay in the game. It was incredible. And you could really, literally see the thought bubbles appearing above the players in blue as they're thinking, it's hard enough to score with 11. Oh, thanks so much for the points again, Stanford Bridge, which of course will help in some of these categories we follow throughout the season, including the away record now, six of a possible 12 points. I think you have to get a plus for that VAR decision. It made an impact in this game. Ollie Watkins... Adds to the combined goals four for our front men. Geez, I wonder if I should have thrown John Duran in there as well. And we improved on our second half plus minus. We're now plus one plus Emmy Martinez earns the all important and treasured clean sheet. Next up, Everton for the Carabao Cup round three. And as much as Sunday was one to savor, I do not believe it was the biggest test of the week that awaits us on Saturday when Brighton and Hove Albion comes to Villa Park. And funny enough, for whatever reason, we've had their number. And if we win that game on Saturday, we'll be even on points with them. And then, of course, you've got Everton this coming Wednesday, and they had a fantastic weekend because they went to Brentford, not an easy place to go, and I thought won comfortably 3 1 over the Bees. Now, Sean Dyche 
has to be very, very mindful as well because he's going to have to rotate his squad too. They've got a monstrous game at Goodison against Luton on Saturday, and a win in that game could move them almost comfortably into that middle pack of the table. So I'm concerned about our defensive injuries and how we're going to rotate this squad. I obviously want the Villa Park record to continue like everybody else, but this is going to be a really tricky week to navigate. Oh, it was another two-win weekend in this household. In fact, I have a clip. I'm going to brag a little bit because this is my son here, Alexander. He's the left back on the team, plays it to Ethan Henry Hoff, makes the overlapping run. And he knows because the old man is always banging on about driving the byline and hooking it back. That's what he does. Rayhan Malik is there to tap it in. Oh, when you win two games in the weekend, it's like having a Sunday roast dinner with Yorkies, gravy, and dessert. And if we could just somehow get through Wednesday, keep the Villa Park thing going, move on to round four, and maybe somehow patch together a team for Saturday against Brighton and Hove Albion. Oh, what a September this will have turned out to be. Until the Carabao Cup, be well, embrace the oncoming autumn, and thank you for watching this show from the bottom of my heart. And as always, up the mighty villa. Villa.